do you consider yourself a philanthropist? When I asked my peers, millennials in the US, this very question, many of them said no. And this surprised me, because my generation is known for championing social good more than any other. We generously donate our time and skills to nonprofits. We're conscious of where we shop. 91% of us say that we would switch from brands we currently use to one that supports a cause. And we're even mindful with our careers. 60% of us say that we've chosen our employer based on their sense of purpose. So I followed up that question with another, and I asked them what words they associated with philanthropy. And here's some of what I heard. Rich, money, elitist, fancy galas, old white men. So clearly, philanthropy isn't resonating as a word with millennials. Apparently, somewhere along the line, philanthropy lost its true meaning. In the Greek origin of the word, philanthropy simply means love of humanity. Now, today what I would like to do is re-examine the face of philanthropy and who gets to call themselves a philanthropist. I believe that in order to do this, we have to look at two major misconceptions. That it takes a lot of money to be a philanthropist, or that it takes any money at all. This is an opportunity to make philanthropy more diverse, inclusive, and inviting than it's ever been. I have a stake in all of this, of course, because my career happens to be in philanthropy. But you have a stake in it, too, because look around at the world that you live in. I'm guessing you're no more satisfied with the news headlines you're reading than I am. Stories of terrorism, fear, violence, racism, misogyny are everywhere. Seven years ago, I was particularly disturbed by stories I was reading about how many millions of girls are out of school around the world. To be more precise, 50 million girls are out of secondary school, and that's a much higher percentage than of the boys. And this just doesn't make any sense, because all of the data shows that the more educated women are in a society, the less poverty, violence, disease, and extremism that there is. So I decided that it would be my life's mission to help ensure girls everywhere would have access to quality education and have the same chance to graduate from high school that I did. I know the power of being a first-generation graduate. I was the first in my family to graduate from college. So in 2009, I launched a social media campaign called She's the First, and it grew into a global nonprofit. Today, She's the First has provided more than 800 girls in low-income countries with scholarships so that they can be the first in their families to finish high school. Thank you, I'm really proud of them. Some of them already have graduated. And when they do, they're in a position to break cycles of generational poverty and pay it forward. So I'm going to uh, share some stories with you about some of my favorite philanthropists who are students. And here's what they're doing to turn pocket change into actual change in people's lives. This is what it takes. Some eggs, water, vegetable oil, boxes of baking mix, food coloring, and the most important ingredient of all, passion. The passion of students and young professionals to make a difference. I'm talking about our annual Bake a Change campaign, which is when tie-dyed cupcake bake sales happen across the country and beyond to raise money to send girls to school. These colorful cupcakes uh, obviously catch people's attention, stop them in their tracks, and create conversations about our mission. I've seen this campaign, which runs for two weeks, raise as much as $50,000, one cupcake at a time. 
And all of that money goes into our scholarship fund, providing girls who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford the opportunity the chance to go to school. This means it covers their tuition, their books, their school supplies, their uniforms. And more than just getting girls to school, our scholarships keep them there because we provide them with a support network. They have access to mentorship groups, tutoring, extracurricular activities. And this is creating long-term change because when a girl graduates, she earns a higher income. She's able to support herself, her future children, her parents, her siblings. She also knows more about health and hygiene. So that slows the spread of contagious disease and delays childbirth. And she also has confidence. She speaks up for herself and makes her own decisions, which makes her far less likely to be a victim of domestic violence or to be forced into an arranged marriage. Now that I've told you one of the ways that we raise money, I want to share, um, I want to go back to the original question that I asked about what you think of when you hear the word philanthropy. And you'll remember this is what my peers in the US thought. So I wanted to ask some other millennials that I know, our scholars, some of those who have graduated, and uh, they're, they're millennials too, just living in lower income countries. I asked them what they thought of when they heard the word philanthropy. And here's what they said. Caring, loving, sharing, human beings, and helping others. I found that to be so fascinating that their perception of philanthropy had no mention of money and was spot on to the true meaning of the word. I asked Ellie, who just turned 24 in Arusha, Tanzania, whether she considered herself a philanthropist. And without hesitation, she told me, yes, everybody can be Bill Gates in her own way. Now, Ellie is, of course, the first in her family to graduate from high school, even though she is the youngest of nine children. And today, she's in college. Here's how she's as much of a philanthropist as the person who funded her scholarship. Ellie knows that even with a college degree, the job market in Tanzania can be tough. And she wants to prevent unemployment problems before they even happen. So one way to do that is through entrepreneurship and learning a monetizable skill. Batik making, for instance, is a skill of dyeing cloth to make tapestries, clothing, bags, products that sell well in the markets of Arusha, Tanzania, where Ellie's from and where tourists go to shop. Ellie happens to know a couple of men who have a successful batik making business. So she invited them to campus and she, and she arranged workshops where she and other young women could learn not only this skill, but how to run a successful business, should they ever need to fall back on that in a time of hardship. Ellie wants to see herself and other women be financially independent, and she's creating opportunities to inspire that. That makes her a philanthropist. I have another story um, from India, but first I want to imagine I want you to imagine that you are a teenage girl from the delete caste, which is the least educated, poorest class in Indian society. You don't go to school, and you're already a mother. Imagine that your child was born with a birth defect. That makes your life even harder, because you get all the blame for that. Your husband beats you, your family has shunned you. They say that you are cursed with evil spirits, and yet you are only a teenage girl. That's what Maheshri, who's 22, grew up seeing happen in her village. But fortunately, Maheshri is not one of those teenage girls. Because when she was young, she got a scholarship to go to boarding school. And in school, she studied science, where she learned that the reason for birth defects wasn't evil spirits, but genetic factors. So when Maheshwari went off to college, guess what she decided to study? Genetics. She's overcome 
every obstacle in her way in pursuing higher education so that she will get her master's degree next year. And the reason she's so dedicated to that is because she wants to do the research and the public health advocacy that will help the poor to understand how the genetic risks that they can prevent those birth defects from happening. And most importantly of all, she wants them to stop placing the blame on young women. If that isn't showing a love of humanity, I don't know what is. Maheshwari is a philanthropist too. What Ellie and Maheshwari's stories show is that philanthropy is a two-way street. There's no contradiction between being the beneficiary of philanthropy and becoming a philanthropist yourself. Philanthropy isn't just for the wealthy or for those from the wealthiest nations. In order for philanthropy to be truly game-changing, we need to widen the playing field and invite more people to participate. I ask for your help in spreading this idea throughout the world because I believe that if more of us identify as philanthropists, rather than feeling excluded from it, then we'll begin to see all of our small, individual actions to better humanity add up faster into real change. So next time someone asks you what you think of when you hear the word philanthropy, I hope you see your son or daughter who has a bake sale. I hope you see the girl that you can provide a scholarship to halfway around the world. And most importantly of all, I hope you see yourself because you are the face of philanthropy. Thank you.